Okay, in the last video on um, Pythagorean music theory uh, about the mathematical lie of the Pythagorean comma, um, I pointed out at the end of the video that they, the math was trying to define the octave as a zero, a zero value when the frequency ratio is one to one. So now we're on Wikipedia on the Pythagorean scale. And here we have the one to one frequency ratio. And then you'll note that the, the value of two is to the zero power. So that proves what I was, how I ended the last video. I said that you have to, you can only understand the octave as being, the, as two being inherently squared already. And this, this actually is what um, Archytas then developed from Philolaeus. So Archytas used the equation that the arithmetic mean, which is the perfect fifth, um, times the, geom the uh, harmonic mean, which is the perfect fourth, equals the geometric mean squared, which is the octave as two to the zero power right here, two to the zero power. And so then what is the geometric mean? The geometric mean is the square root of two, which is then actually the, the tritone or um, nine eighths cubed as the tritone. Now, if you look at the, um, now, okay, what it, I, I posted a, sh a short video that the, what got me into discovering the non-commutativity of the music theory from Alon Khan is the simple question when I was 16 years old, why can't two-thirds be a perfect fifth in the Western music scale? And the reason is, is that when you have that equation as a the first log logarithmic equation was from Philolaeus. Um, in the in the ancient Greek, he used the word magnitude to define the ratio, and so he's, he was equating the perfect fifth um, and perfect fourth ratios, um, not based on the one as frequency but um, saying that it doesn't matter what the root tonic is as the one. And so, therefore, um, the, he defined the one as the difference, the Pythagorean comma, the one equals <clears throat> the difference between um, two to the 19th and three to the 12th. And that's what the last video went into. So, Ar what Ar Archytas just built on that same concept of the irrational magnitude, what was called a logon in um, in Greek, the ancient Greek. So you have the the logos, L O G O S, was from Pythagorean philosophy. But now we're talking about we're promoting a logon as based on the geometric mean. So, so you can see here that the perfect fourth was actually derived from the perfect fifth as the undertone, and there's your two thirds. And now this is why some music theorists call the perfect fourth the phantom tonic, because it comes from the perfect fifth, but in order to come from that, that perfect fifth, you have to have a different... Um, 
root tonic, meaning a different value of the one as a phantom tonic. No, so what Philolaus did is he was using his lyre, his lyre musical instrument, and he, and the lyre is tuned based on having it's like a harp. Um, and so you have the the lowest or frequency or the longest string is is facing your body. It's closest to your body. And Professor Richard McCurahan, he recently did a translation on Philolaus, and because the they the Western um, uh, philosophers or, sci or early scientists they could not understand Philolaus because he's you know his I mean you have to translate the Greek, but then you got to figure out and what what Richard McCarahan figured out was that he's actually flipping his lyre around in order to change the octave back into the root to uh, based on like flipping the the intervals around so that he had to use the um, zero to eight as the the frequency this the wavelength as the new one to get the ratio of um of um eight six for the four thirds um and so when you have for as as a as the the so the the um the string length is six eighths and then the weight the the wavelength is six eighths and then the frequency is eight six and so then the issue is why does it have to be four thirds and three halves again that's because you can't have the logarithmic value as Philolaus set up um, and then was later um, codified by Archytas as this equation um, the earth arithmetic mean times the harmonic mean equals the geometric mean squared um, which is the this two two to the zero and so um, you can't have that unless you're using three halves for the perfect fifth and not two thirds and, and so um, so when they when they have three to the negative one, that's actually the non commutative inversion to create the perfect fourth from a different root tonic. So when you see that negative one, that's actually a different root tonic of the of the one. And so that's what's being covered up because when you do the when you're using this, when you look at the equation that Phil Leis used, you know, to invert, to get um, 2 to the 19th and then 3 to the 12th, um, by assuming you can just convert the these inversions without realizing that the, the geometry is different because a perfect fifth in the same scale is uh, C to F as the geometry in terms of pitch. So this is C to F in, in frequency above the root tonic, and this is C to F in the other direction so that you have you have an octave with this, this value of three to the one um, this is the, a different root tonic, and that's why the um, the perfect fourth can never be an overtone of the one, because in order to have an overtone, it has to the the denominator has to be in a two, you know, to maintain the same pitch. So, for example, three halves is an overtone of the one. So. Um, because it has two in the, the denominator. So for example, so in Indian South Asian music, if you have a drone with two notes and you play the one, the one first, and then you play a perfect fourth as a higher frequency, 
this perfect fourth will become the new octave as a different one so that the three will now be a new root tonic and it'll, and so that the, the perfect fourth will be heard as an octave with a different um, a different fundamental uh, pitch fundamental pitch um, and they they analyze this in music theory all the time like how how do you hear a fundamental pitch that's not there because you hear it based on the overtones oops hold on so okay where was I all right so so okay so what Phil Lewis did is he used this um, zero to the eighth to get four thirds as six eighths, and then as I ex and then he added that to eight twelve eighths to get the first logarithmic equation because you learn in basic music theory that the perfect fifth plus the perfect fourth equals the octave, and but what they're saying is that 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 octave value again is actually a geometric it's assuming a squaring a squaring value because Phil Lais he just argued he argued a ratio of ratios um, argument that the actual this value of the one does not exist as a based on listening listening to the one no longer is the source of music what is the source of this one is the ratio difference between um, 2 to the 19th and 3 to the 12th. But when you use that ratio difference, you're ignoring the fact that when you invert the 3 halves and 2 thirds, you get a different geometry because 3 halves to the 1 is C to G as a perfect fifth, whereas 2 thirds is C to F as an undertone perfect fifth. So then, um, <clears throat> the as uh, Sir James Jean, Jeans points out, if you're if you stick to the actual perfect fifth as an overtone and perfect fifth as an undertone, you get this infinite spiral. But in fact, as Alain Khan points out, um, when you what they're doing is they're putting this perfect fifth undertone back into the same octave by doubling it times two to get four thirds as the perfect fourth. So what Alon Kahn's is pointing out is that when you're doing that doubling, actually you're relying on these inverse exponentials and therefore it's non-commutative inherently. So that the instead of defining the one as the difference between two to the nineteenth and three to the twelfth, the one is actually two to the nineteenth and three to the twelfth difference along with three to the one nineteenth and two to the one twelfth difference. And those two differences combined are non non local; they're overlapping. And and that's why Alon Khan states that the um, the non commutativity is d denser than the real numbers. Because here, when they say two to the zero, they're referring to the real numbers. Because then you get the square root of two. As the um, the two is the geometric mean squared with that zero, so then the the geometric mean is the square the square root of two is the tritone, which is the nine nine eighths cubed. So you see, you got you already have the two two eight two two cubed. So when you cube the nine eighths, and you get the square root of two. Okay, so. So this is how they, they, in Western mathematics, they're assuming 
all the way ever since Philolaus and Archytas, and then promoted by Plato. They're defining the one as a as a geometric ratio and not based. It's a geometric ratio of ratios, and it's not based on listening to the source of the one. And if you rely on listening to the source of the one, you have this overlap of the four thirds and the three halves being this in alchemy. This is called the single perfect yang because the yin as four thirds is actually the yang as a undertone. And so the whole point of alchemy is you take the yin as four thirds and you convert it back into its yang. And so this is this was then rediscovered in quantum physics, and it was called the quantum undertone, but it's more commonly known as a quantum beat. And what a quantum beat is, is a <clears throat> negative resonance, which is, this is what that is, a negative resonance, but it's a negative resonance from the future. So in a sense, by having a different one as a root tonic, you're essentially saying that your your um, spectral in the uh, frequency is from the future because it's a negative frequency. So it's also or or reverse time. It's either negative frequency or reverse time. You know, this would be one or the other. So that gets you into relativistic quantum physics based on spin. And so then you're defining spin due to the imaginary time as the square root of negative one. So if you think of it like um, they're talking about two to the power of zero as the geometric mean, then you're having two to the the negative one so that the instead of the geometric mean being zero the geometric mean is being negative one so then you're taking the square root of negative one and take instead of the square root of zero um so i'm, I'm just i'm kind of just analyzing on my own you know i'm going into my own <laughs> figuring it out but um, so that's how um, when Philolaus flipped his lyre around, then he was able to change what the root tonic was, and it's no. So then he's saying that it's no lo no longer based on listening. So then you can ignore the fact that the the three halves changes the geometric um, pitch value when you invert it. You can just ignore that. But if you, if you don't ignore it and you're honest, then you get this infinite spiral of pitch. But it's not just infinite. It's overlapping of the future and the past. It's, it's non-local. And so by, by defining this 2 to the 0, as there, see, I just pointed out in the last, in the Pythagorean comma Wikipedia page, it's this one-to-one -one value if you look into it and research it, it's actually defined by the difference between 2 to the 19th and 3 to the 12th. And so that's why they say the octave is 0. Because they're, they're, not, they're saying the octave doesn't exist. But if you actually listen to the 1, the octave inherently exists as the first overtone or undertone due to this infinite resonance of energy from the future and the past overlapping. So that's what they're denying. And I call this the natural resonance revolution because you have to reclaim your inherent truth of reality as the source of the one. And in Pythagorean philosophy, they state the, the one is not a number because this, it's actually light and you turn that light around and you listen to the source of the light and then you get the resonance of the two 
and the resonance of the two is actually what they call um, a paron, a paron as as formless awareness that's female. The a paron is like the cosmic mother, as a popus in Egyptian philosophy, alchemy. But here Plato defined the um, dyad of the octave as the based on the um, the as the geometric mean squared from Archytas, and therefore the geometric mean as is the true dyad as the square root of two or a logon, and then the inverse of the logarithms from the square root of two or as a logon from this nine eighths cubed. The inverse of that is the exponential function. So therefore you have, when you listen to Western music theory, what they're doing is they're doing mind control to then justify exponential growth of, of wealth for the elite. And then democracy is defined by the logarithmic uh, geometric ratios. As, as And Plato stated that each citizen has to compromise their tuning into a logon for the good of the state. And the state is then defined by this geometric mean squared. And this is explained by Ernest McLean, the musicologist, in his book, um, The Pythagorean Plato. It's also explained by um, economist Michael E. Hudson, who he started out in uh, music theory. So sorry for smacking my lips. I, I get my mouth is kind of dry from uh, had too much salt or something. Anyway, um, I I'm just swallowing a lot. That's it. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna leave it at that. It's real abstract stuff, but uh, let's see. So you know, they by flipping these these inversions around, they hide the fact the, uh, that Alain Khan points out that in fact, when you, instead of deriving the, um, the scale from, you know, the undertone that's inverted by, um, by defining the octave as zero, you can hide the fact that it's non-commutative. So then when Alain Khan points out that the logarithms are actually Three to the one nineteenth and two to the one twelfth. Therefore, the this this one to one is inherently non-local, as the inversion of they just have two to the nineteenth and three to the twelfth. But you have to include the three to the um one nineteenth and two to the one twelfth. All right, and I'll just prove prove that I'm on the. Pythagorean tuning Wikipedia page here. See, that's what I've been talking about. That I've been talking about the Pythagorean um, te tetractus, the secret of the Pythagorean tetractus. Okay, thank you.